welcome back to Fossil Ridge Games. Today I'm extremely excited to walk you through Dune Imperium Uprising. For today's video, I'm going to go ahead and walk you through the new game mechanics that you're going to find in this new standalone set. If you are new to Dune Imperium, I do have some other videos on my channel that can help you out with the other basic rule mechanics. One of the most iconic aspects of Dune are these giant sandworms that exist throughout the franchise. So the first thing I'm going to do in this video is walk you through all of the new rules for the giant sandworms. So the first thing that we're going to try to figure out is how to get these epic monsters onto the table. So the first thing that you're going to need to do, and I'm going to go ahead and just zoom in specifically on the Fremen faction tracker, is that you need at least two influence with the Fremen. Once you've done that, you're going to go to what's called Siege Tabor. And Siege Tabor has been updated in this version of the map to include a new icon. So what I'm pointing at right here is a sand hook. And this is going to be how you actually summon the worms. So as an example, we're going to get two faction with the Fremen. So we're going to have our two influence with the Fremen. That allows us to go to Siege Tabor. So when I place my agent in this location, it's going to allow me to take one of these maker hooks and what I'm going to do is place the maker hook in my portion of the board where I place my garrison. So as an example, if I'm playing the green player, here is where my garrison is. I'm going to go ahead and place the hook in this location. This now means from this point forward, I can summon sandworms into the conflict. I'm going to walk you through how that works. Next, I'm going to show you a protected area. So you notice that there's a barrier on the map. And then there's this token right here. This is called the shield wall token. I'm gonna go ahead and put it in place. When the game starts, the shield wall is intact. Now, what does that mean? Is that the sandworms are in the deep desert, and if the shield wall is intact, they can't get into this portion of the map. So thus, the sandworms can't be used to do battle in any of these three locations. So we have the spice refining, spice refinery, we have Arakeen, and then we also have the Imperial Basin. Now as a game mechanic, and I'll go back to Siege Tabor, <clears throat> so I'm going to zoom in, and you're going to notice this new icon on the board, and basically what this is, destroys the shield wall. So once I have the maker hooks, and this is an ore section at Siege Tabor, I can come back here and hit this space so I can get a water and then I can destroy the shield wall token. So when I destroy the shield wall token, I simply remove it from the game. And then from that point forward, sandworms can get into the conflict area in these three different locations. As another reminder, if you're playing with the sandworms, you're gonna notice that the conflict cards have been modified. And we have two different colors. So we have red conflict cards, and these are just gonna be normal cards that you are used to playing in this game. Then we also have the ones with the yellow background. So the ones with the yellow background actually are for the locations behind the shield wall. So as an example, uh, this one is the battle for the Imperial Basin. And if you remember, the Imperial Basin is just right here, but it's in the shield wall. So if the shield wall is up, the sandworm can't come into this location. So another way to kind of double check this is that the backgrounds on the conflict cards are different. I'm gonna walk you through what the worms actually do in combat. We're going to assume that our green player has three troops in their garrison. They do have the maker hooks and are thus able to summon a sandworm. We know that we're fighting for the Imperial Basin. We know that the shield wall is down. And what that means is that this worm can be placed directly into the conflict. It comes into play and it's going to go into the green quadrant on the board. As a quick reminder of how much power it has, right underneath the conflict card, there is a key that shows you that the sandworm is going to be worth three combat value when you actually use it. So as an example, it's going to be worth three. And then as another example, we can see that just normally the troops are gonna be worth two apiece, so we're gonna have a little bit of a disparity. Now what's cool about the sandworms 
is that they're going to give you an additional bonus whether you win the conflict or not. And I'm going to go ahead and walk you through that. But first, once a, once a sandworm is used, it's just simply removed from the board. It does not go back into your garrison. It goes back into the general supply off the board. And what that means is that multiple players can be summoning sandworms. You don't actually own the sandworm. You just own it temporarily for that conflict. Finally, I'm going to walk you through what happens with the sandworm if it's present in a conflict, and then you go to score that conflict. As an example, we're going to have our battle for the Imperial Basin. We're going to say that the shield wall is down, and we have three players in this game of Dune Imperium. You're going to notice that since we have three players, what that means is that the first and second portion of this card are going to be active and the third part is not, simply because that's how the rules are. In a three player game, not everybody can win. It's just gonna be the top two players out of three. So as an example, we're gonna pop back to the board and we're gonna see kind of what happens. So we see that a red player is kind of lagging behind. They only have one troop in the conflict. Next, we have the green player that has the sandworm, and thus they're going to have three points. And then finally, our purple player is going to win the conflict. So the purple player is going to take all of the benefits at the top of the card. Next, we're going to move down to this portion of the card. We can see that the second player, which is going to be our green player with the worm, is actually going to receive five spice. But since they have a sandworm in the conflict, that player can score this twice. So what that means is that the green player can actually score five spice, and then they're gonna score the same thing again because they had a worm in the conflict. What's interesting about this rule is that they didn't actually win the conflict, but they had a worm in the conflict, so it doubles up the rewards. It's kind of a subtle sort of thing, but what makes this rule pretty cool is that if you go through the trouble of even summoning the sandworm to the conflict, you're going to get some pretty hefty rewards out of it. So it makes it very impactful, even though you don't win that conflict. To close out some of the conflict stuff in the new Dune Imperium Uprising, I'm going to walk you through these objective cards. At the start of the game, randomly, each player is going to receive one of these cards. And what's interesting about this, and I'm going to go ahead and just pull one up so you can look at the upper right-hand corner. You're going to see that there's a Chris knife in the upper right-hand corner of this. Then also we have an ornithopter, and then we have one of the desert rat type things that lives on the planet Arrakis. This is going to be kind of an interesting way that you can score additional points. So what does this mean? Let's say I'm playing the game. And the green player is going to start with this card with the Ornithopter icon on it. And then we go back and we look at the battle for the Imperial Base. And we're going to notice that the Ornithopter icon is also present at the top of this card. So in this simulation, we're going to say that the green player actually wins this conflict. Definitely has more troops invested in the battle. And once that happens... In this version of Dune Imperium, when you win a conflict, you're going to take it and you're going to put it off to the side. And the whole point of doing that is that you're going to try to make pairs. So if you ever make a pair of objective cards, so as an example, this is the one I started with, and then this is my conflict card that I gained from winning the conflict, this now makes a pair because the icons match at the top. When that happens, you simply just flip these cards over in your play area and then you're going to gain one victory point. So we're gonna go ahead and just pop over. We're gonna say that the green player um, gained a victory point, obviously from the conflict. So we're gonna see like, hey, they gained this victory point from the conflict. But since they got a pair of these cards, they then gain another victory point. So by using these objectives, you can actually gain a, like, you know, maybe one extra victory point over the course of the game. The final thing that you're going to notice on these objective cards is that they're going to have things in the top left corner. So as an example, and this is going to be hard to zoom in on, this says one to three P, which means one to three players. When you are randomizing these at the start of the game, these are going to be the objective cards. This one's going to be present in the game because we have three players 
And so what you're going to see is that there's this uh, desert rat looking thing on Arrakis, but it also has the first player token marker on it. This is a way in which you randomize who the first player is when you're playing Dune Imperium. So as an example, if I have a three player game and I have the green, the red, and the purple player on board, the green player gets this one, the red player gets this one, the purple player gets this one. So since the red player gets this card initially, they are going to start with the first player marker and they will go ahead and get the game going. The next part of the video is going to be focused on spies and observation posts. This is a new mechanic they added, and I absolutely love this mechanic. I'm going to focus on the Bene Gesserit section of the board for this discussion. What we're going to see is that we have the espionage space, and in this case we have a card drawing mechanic, but now we have this new icon, and this is going to key off of several new pieces that have been added to the game. So as an example, I'm going to take one of these pieces and notice it looks kind of like a like a tall cylinder, tall cylindrical piece. And each of the factions is going to have three of these. So as an example, the purple player is going to start the game with three of these in their reserve. So how does this work? I'm going to take my agent. I'm going to put him on this space. I have to pay one spice because that's the cost to go here. I'm going to go ahead and draw a card. And now what this is going to allow me to do is place a spy somewhere on the board. So I have this marker right here. This is a pretty cool mechanic, and I'm gonna show you a spot that I really favor when I play this game. So I'm just gonna pop up one position to the spacing guild. So here I am in the spacing guild portion of the game, and notice that the purple player has already claimed the highliner location this turn round. Now normally what that means is that I can't place an agent here because somebody's already taken it. But since I have the new spy, I can actually take the spy and put it in this location right here. This is an observation post. So I'm going to go ahead and just zoom in. Kind of what it looks like is a little gray eyeball icon. And notice that it's attached to these two spaces. So as the green player, I'm going to place a spy in this location. And this now means that the green player is spying on both of these spots through that observation post itself. So I can do a couple different things with the spy. So once it's on the board, I'm gonna walk you through how you utilize that spy. So first up, if I have a spy, I can do what's called gather intelligence. And this, in my opinion, is the least impactful of using one of these spy markers, but I'll walk you through how it works. If I were to take my agent and let's say place it in the deliver supply location on the board, that would net me one faction with the spacing guild. In addition to that, once I perform that action, I can actually remove this spy because it's now connected to a location where I sent one of my agents and thus I can gather intelligence. Gathering intelligence just simply allows you to draw one card and then that goes directly into your hand. Now that, that's interesting, but quite honestly, I think the spies are a lot more powerful and potent than that. Let's go ahead and, and walk through this example in a slightly different manner. So we know that the purple player has placed the Highliner agent and thus has gained a massive number of troops. This is gonna be very tough for the rest of the players on the board to overcome those five combat troops who are most likely dropped directly into the conflict. That's why you purchase the Highliner space. It's massively impactful, especially toward the end of the game. Now, you being the purple player might feel pretty confident that you have that conflict in the bag, but what the green player can do since they have a spy on a connecting observation post is that they can use their agent to infiltrate. And what's kind of cool about that is that let's say I play a Spacing Guild uh, card, I'm gonna increase my faction by one. I can actually take my agent and now place it in this location by removing my spy from the table. And this is called infiltration. So it's going to allow me to place my agent in a spot that's already been taken. This can be extremely surprising 
when you're playing this game because you think, oh, I got this conflict all, all taken care of, and then all of a sudden you get a surprise attack. So quite honestly, one of my favorite locations on the board for putting a spy is right here. Another one that I really like quite a bit is in the Imperial faction, so the Sadikar board space. You can put uh, a spy right here as well. So I find those to be fairly impactful, especially toward the end of the game when you're trying to amass troops, really win those conflicts and get those victory points. Uh, the game gets super competitive probably after, I would say, turn five or six. It gets super, super competitive because you try to get all of those conflict victory points, especially when you hit like the last four rounds of the game where those level three conflicts are popping, all each and every one of those has victory points that you can win. So this is kind of a, a very cool new mechanic that they added into the game. Now, something else that I can put into perspective, I'm gonna go ahead and, and take this right here and kind of put it back. Now, something else that I can do is that, let's say I had a correct sort of like corresponding corresponding icon. So I'm going to do this a little bit differently. I'm going to pop over to the top up here and we're going to say that um, we've got something going on here. The purple player has already got their sword master for the turn. The green player now has a spy at that observation post. This one's pretty frustrating too. When this is blocked, it prevents you from getting an additional agent. But in this case, I'm gonna walk you through how we can get this to work and not lose our spy. So I'm going to put a card onto the board. This is called Dangerous Rhetoric. And we're gonna notice that I have to go to a green uh, space to use it, but I also have an observation post icon on here. If I were to play this card, what that icon allows me to do is I can put down my agent and then not remove the spy from that location if I have this icon actually on the card. So this is kind of like a, a freebie that I can use. So I can use this spy over and over again. And what makes it super cool is that I have this sort of observation post symbol on here. So I can just keep reusing that over and over again, which is a huge advantage. Since we're having a conversation about spies and great places to put them, and we kind of just talked about the one at the top of the board, I'm gonna walk you through why this spy is impactful as well. There was a pretty significant change made to the top of the board, specifically the High Council. And this was a spot that was fairly coveted. Most of the times when you play the game, I would say most players try to get a seat on the High Council. Now the original board just simply had you going to this location once and then you get your seat on the High Council and there's no need to ever go back to it. Now what they added to the game, and I think it's super cool, is that the second time you go to this space onward, you get all of these different bonuses. And I think that's pretty amazing. So another location I do like putting a spy is up here because it gives me then flexibility. I can go back to the High Council and get all of these resources for going there. Now, obviously, the price is going to be just a little bit steep because you do have to pay five Solari to do that. Now, something that is kind of hidden in this game is that once you get to a certain point in this game, you, so your Solari is not as impactful. Probably the two best places to spend your Solari is going to be the High Council space, and then in addition to that, the Swordmaster space on the board. So once you sort of get to like the mid or late game, your Solari can be spent by cashing it in and getting all of these bonuses and buffs. Seriously, getting three troops and an entry card, especially toward the late end of the game, that's a, that's a really excellent bonus. So don't count out this space to put your uh, spy down toward the mid to late game. One final note on spies that I want to kind of bring home because I saw several players try to do this. If you spend your spy to perform the infiltration portion, please note that you can only infiltrate a spot with an enemy agent. You can't perform an infiltration action and go to the same spot that you already have an agent. So thus, you can never place two of your agent markers on the same space. It always has to be somebody else's. So like as an example, 
if this were the scenario on the board, you could definitely do that. And being the purple player, you could spend this to go to that spot. But you can never spend a spy to go to the same spot twice. Next up, we're going to be talking about the contract mechanic. And this is something that's pretty easy to play. It's optional in the game, but honestly, I don't think it's that hard to play. So it was easy to add in. So the first thing that we're going to do is just simply take an agent and then we're going to go to a location on the board with a contract space. In this case it is the Imperial faction. And then there is this icon right here, which corresponds to a position on the board. When you play this down, uh, basically there's going to be two of these contracts face up on the table. And as the player, you get to select one of those. So as an example, there is this one right here. It just says immediate and two Solari. So once you go here, you go ahead and take this off the table and then you go ahead and replace it with a new one. So in this case, a new contract is going to pop onto the board. Most of the contracts have you do something to get a reward. As an example, here is the harvest contract and you can see that it tells you to harvest three spice and then you get three solari. So this is kind of something that's a little bit ancillary. Think of it this way, you're gonna be harvesting spice anyway. So in this case, you're gonna gain an additional three solari. Here's another example, and this one's called Arakeen. And in this case, you're gonna get one troop and one spy if you just simply go to the board space Arakeen. Now there's going to be two contract spaces on the board, first one that we already showed you, and then there's one in the upper right hand corner as well that says accept contract. So go ahead and add this into your game if you feel like it. If you think that's a little bit too random and too chaotic for you, this is the default right here. And if you don't actually want to use the contract tokens, you can go ahead and just say anytime you go to a contract space, you gain two Solari. Next, I'm going to have a quick conversation with you. If you are a veteran Dune Imperium player and you have the two additional sort of booster sets, the first one's going to be the Rise of X, and then the second one's going to be Immortality. So in this case, I'm going to say that we have the Rise of X expansion, and you can see that the top right portion of the board is going to be covered with an overlay. And when you get the Rise of X expansion, I'll go ahead and just like pop this out. This board feature kind of folds out and it's meant to cover up the top of the board. If you're playing Dune Uprising with the Rise of X expansion, go ahead and just fold this in half. And you're gonna put this overlay on the top right hand corner of the board. Something else that's a little bit strange, so we'll go ahead and just talk about it real quick, is that there are no observation posts printed on the card because this expansion came into being before the Uprising expansion. So I'm just going to take a spy and kind of put it in between these two sections. And this is just going to say there is actually an observation point there, although it's not printed on the board. Uh, next up, there's going to be another portion of the Rise of X, and this is going to be sort of the Dreadnought space. And you're going to just put that to the side of the board as well. And then in addition, there's going to be an observation post also on the side. Next up, we're going to talk about immortality. So I'm going to just pop out back to the board space. And there is an overlay that exists in immortality. And I'll go ahead and kind of zoom in on it. And it's going to be located at the research station. So this is going to be what it looks like normally in Uprising. You're just going to take this simple research station overlay. Notice it has the microscope icon for immortality. You're going to go ahead and just simply place that on the board uh, to act as an overlay. So in that respect, you can mix both Uprising with the other expansions. And there are some detailed instructions in the book. There are certain cards that they ask you to remove from the Imperial Road draw deck, things of that nature. So be sure that if you're going to be using all the expansions, go through and adapt accordingly. But for the most part, you can see that Immortality and the Rise of Ix seem to fit pretty good with the game. Um, just as a general preference, having gone through this several times, I'm going to recommend, I think the best play option for me was Rise of Ix in conjunction with Uprising. I think that provided the best sort of games. 
Um, immortality is interesting. I don't, I don't think it adds a, a whole ton, especially when you're playing with sandworms. But I will say this, having dreadnoughts and sandworms, both those mechanics together was really exciting. So the combats were really fantastic and a lot of fun. So I do definitely recommend if you're a new player and you just got Uprising, probably one of the best expansions that you could get for it. So I'd, I'd recommend getting Uprising in conjunction with Rise of X. I think those two products together are pretty interesting and fun. Over the course of this video, I have shown you all of the new game mechanics that are present in Dune Imperium Uprising. I think this game adds a lot of cool new mechanics to the franchise, things that I didn't really expect. You know, as an example, I really enjoyed the spy mechanic and the observation post mechanic. I thought that was very fun, kind of a fresh spin on the game. Very, very neat. In addition to that, I feel that the sandworm mechanics are very, very interesting. It adds a lot of strategy, especially as you can get double rewards when you're playing with the conflict cards themselves. Another thing that's really interesting, and I, I almost feel like this is sort of a reboot of the original game, but a lot of the faction trackers so to speak, on the left-hand side of the board. A lot of those spaces were redone. Also, too, they redid the High Council at the top of the board as well. So when you put all this together, I think the game is just a little bit better balanced, and I like this board a lot more. So I'm going to probably gravitate more towards playing the sort of upgraded version of Dune Imperium, specifically Uprising. Another thing that I thought was really interesting, I really enjoyed playing Dune Uprising with the Rise of Ix expansion. I think those two expansions together really blended well, and I thought the game was just a lot of fun. Just the additional combat depth, having Dreadnoughts and Sandworms at the same time, and troops, and then throwing entry cards into the mix really added extra depth to the combat which honestly was, was a very, very basic mechanic in the game. So I think they kind of spruce that up and jazz that up just a little bit. So it is a lot cooler. I want to thank you all for joining me today. And as always, have fun gaming.